Hermione Wilde's reads Evan Gilford Blake's Like You Were the Blues. On the back of the scarred wood door is a calendar. 1993 is imprinted beneath the beer company logo. The pages with the months hang below. The current one is September. Sketches of falling leaves are scattered across the boxes with the dates. She's seen it, or one like it, a thousand times. Their dressing room, Durigu. The Spartan room is panelled in scratched walnut veneer. The usual mirrors run the 16 foot length of the makeup counter where only her makeup and the assorted paraphernalia lie. She is, after all, the name, the one they pay to see. And anyway, she's the only woman, used to be, she'd have to share it with men, not anymore. Elderberry Wine's owner grants her that privilege. The mirrors into which she peers from time to time to check just how red her eyes are are surrounded by the usual weak lights. A black and white plastic clock on the wall above shows 8.32. The second hand turns relentlessly. In eight minutes, Dubois will knock. The door is closed and there are no windows. The air is stale, despite the fan at the far end of the counter that hums inharmoniously, blowing the few dresses on the grey steel rack in random patterns. There's a comfortable floral print cushioned chair whose colours jive with nothing else in the room. A squeaky wheeled wrought iron stand with a mini wood grain refrigerator and a warm faux black leather covered love seat. A small oak table on which an open instrument case sits and three armless oak chairs. She sits on one in her modestly fashionable navy and ivory long sleeved below the knee cool wool dress. Her back stiff. Luli's hands are on her knees, her wet eyes close and leak. Beyond the room there are sounds, music and ambient noise. The sort she's heard most every night of her adult life, white noise. Like too much of the music she hears in places that try to emulate elderberry wine. But fall short. That's not music, is it baby? She opens her eyes and dabs them with a tissue, glances at the clock, at the mirrors, then at the love seat and sighs. How are you doing, baby? You comfortable? She murmurs. I always like that love seat. That's what they call it, a love seat, because people, they sit on it real close, holding each other, like they're in love. I'll do it with you, because I love you more than I love breathing. You know that, don't you? And people make love on it too, sometimes, if they're small enough, sometimes even if they're not. She laughs. It's a downtrodden laugh. No mirth left in it, just a way to get it out of the heart and into the air, where it collects on her face for people to see and think. That's what six months of constant, intractable pain looks like. I made love on one just like that. Made love, made you. Made your beautiful face and your body. And you just loved me loving you. Like you were the blues themselves, because we both know what they mean. We both do. She sighs deeply and stands wearily. Almost time for the show, Shan. You're going to listen, aren't you? You never get tired of listening. Lulu goes to the open case, lifts the instrument, a pocket trumpet. Its silver body and bow glimmering, even in the dull light. Polishes it a moment, then inhales deeply and blows into the mouthpiece. Just a few blue measures to remind herself the beauty of the sound she can make. Although she is intimate with every note she creates, she has blown each one, heard each one, sweated each one, loved each one a million times. But even a million times, each one is a snowflake, just a little bit different, half a heartbeat longer, a rainbow in the arc unnoticeable to anyone else, a never-before-present quiver in the tremolo and she always marvels at the trumpet's lightning fluidity. It's smaller than the B-flat Clifford and Miles and Dizzy played, but the sound is just as rich, just as encompassing. She's bound in it. Has she persists rapping? Her every waking hour is consumed with those sounds. Now, before it was Chanterelle and the trumpet, She still hears them both constantly, like the wind hears the thunder and the rain. She sits on the edge of the love seat, reaches down and touches it. 
Trumpet sweet too, mostly as sweet as you. You like the blues too, don't you? Lulu sighs. You be good now, I gotta... Someone raps on the door. A man's voice says. Lulu, five minutes. She nods. There's a pause. The voice adds, okay? Lulu continues to look at the love seat. She strokes it with one hand, caresses the vows with the other. Lulu, the voice says a little more insistently. Okay, she replies, barely audible. What? I said okay, Dubois. Okay? You need anything? I need, she begins emphatically, then lowers her voice to a whisper. To go back in time. Can you help me with that? What? says Dubois. Nothing, Lily answers. I'll be out in a minute. OK, Dubois raps on the door once and leaves. He's busy. He's a good man. Just new to her world. He met her, stepped into it for the first time tonight. He has sympathy, but it's matter of fact. There's no understanding. Whatever else, things have to be tended to. After all, even things that don't really matter. Lily stands and looks down. I'll be back, baby, I promise, she whispers, as soon as I can. Carrying the trumpet, she steps to the counter and looks at her unused makeup. I don't need that, she thinks. I need this. She picks up a thin plastic syringe and squirts a drop from the tip. Yes, no. Lily stares at it. In the reflection, she can see the empty love seat behind her. Evan Guilford Blake writes plays, prose, and poetry. His work has appeared in about a hundred publications. His scripts have won 46 competitions. 38 of his plays are published. His published long-form prose includes the novels Animation, The Bluebird Prince and the award-winning story collection American Blues, as well as the award-winning chapbook in Realms of Light and Darkness. His genre novel will be published next summer by Black Opal Press. (laughs) 